Okay, so this next section is all about time management and there's three exercises or three tools that you can use to help somebody with time management. One of the things that I find very often with clients is that they say they would like to do something. They'd like to have more time to, to study or like to have more time to read or go to the gym, but they just get tied up. They just don't have enough hours in the day. And so this first exercise is to check where do you currently spend your time. In the left hand column we've got some examples of where we might be spending time sleeping, watching TV, cooking, etc. In the middle column, currently how much time do you spend on each of those areas? And then in the right hand column, in the future, how much time would you spend on those? Did you know that if you watch TV for four hours per day, which is not really difficult if you think about it from, let's say, you got home at six o'clock, had dinner, watch TV from six until ten o'clock. I know a lot of people that watch that amount of TV. But if you watch four hours TV per day, by the time you hit around 65, you would have watched near enough nine years worth of TV. Nine years of your life of watching TV. Now, if we think about what Malcolm Gladwell said in his book, Outliers, he said say, it takes around about 10,000 hours to really master a particular area so to really become very proficient in a particular area so come to think about it that's round about 10 years and so if I wasn't watching TV I could become a master in a particular area that I chose you know this reminds me of the guy who was playing piano and he put on this beautiful show and afterwards in the foyer the lady came up and said to him you know what I would give my life to play piano like you and he turned around and he said to her I did you see people very often just see the end result they don't see the work that went into achieving that result and I thought that was very interesting coming back to where do you spend your time of course if we look uh, both at the currently and in the future columns at the bottom we'll see that there's a total now those totals should add, add up to 24 hours we're 24 hours in the day let's say that my client was watching four hours TV per day and they said you know what they just don't have any time to cook healthy meals and they weren't doing spending any time cooking again I've met a number of people where that's been the case where if they now in the future only spent two hours watching TV then they could have two hours for preparing meals it's just an example it's very hypothetical of course you know every day can be different and so you might have one of these for a Monday through to Sunday so it's quite possible for the client to have seven of these as they might not be working or driving to work on a Saturday and a Sunday and so the days would be different and where they allocate their time would be different so that's the first first exercise okay so next let's look at the default diary and so this is a wonderful example just of how we can really get very specific with the time that we allocate to certain things each and every day. Now on page 43 we've broken the day down from 6 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the afternoon and of course you can change that to however you'd like that to do. Mine would run from 5 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. So I wake up at 5 and go to bed at 10. You'll also notice that of course there's Monday through to Sunday and the idea here is to fit in all the things that have to happen so the default things that have to happen every day during the week example I like to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and let's say for the first two hours I'm going to be doing some reading and some meditation maybe for the first hour just do some reading so five till six will be reading blocked out for every day between six to seven every day will be blocked out for re, uh, for doing some mindfulness 
then maybe between 7 till 8 o'clock will be time for breakfast, getting ready for the day, you know, seeing the kids off to school. Between 8 till 9 on a Monday morning, I might do a sales meeting. And so if that was going to happen, that will be blocked out into the diary. Let's say maybe the sales meeting happens at 4 to 5 on a Friday afternoon. That get blocked, blocked out in the diary. If I had specific clients that I had to see or do coaching sessions, they will be blocked out in the diary. We like to sit down for dinner each night. So between half past 5 and half past 6 is our dinner time. And so you will notice that as you block out all the times that you are doing things that have to happen, it'll be amazing to see how much free time you then actually have in between. You see what happens is, have you ever had one of those days where you were really, really, really busy, but at the end of the day, it felt like you've achieved nothing? It's very easy for people to actually fill up their day doing stuff, but not actually getting to the important things. Whereas if we have a default diary noted down the important things, the things that have to be done, then I have time in between to slot in maybe some unforeseen things or some additional things that might need to happen or some nice things that I would like to add that, you know, maybe just didn't fit in with the diary beforehand. So the default diary is a great tool. Remember, of course, during the day that you also want to take some breaks. So it's important to have those in as well. So that's the default diary. Now, page 44, we've got how important is it? And, you know, I'd like to give this acknowledgement, obviously, to Stephen Covey. And we're looking here to break down all the activities that we do into these four boxes so you list all of your activities and assign importance to each of those on a scale of one to five and assign urgency to each of those on a scale of one to five and as you do that then you just plot those items and you fill them into this matrix so what are the things that are urgent and important you know here these are things like uh, Things that maybe you didn't foresee. The best approach is to leave some time in your schedule to handle some of these things that might come up. Some urgent things that are important that maybe you know you just didn't foresee them. And then of course there's some of those things that are urgent and important but you just put them off. And so here planning might be very useful. Of course the not urgent but important these activities are actually the ones that help us to achieve our goals. So we want to ensure that we've got plenty of time for the things that are not urgent, but important. Give yourself enough time to deal with the unforeseen problems, and this will help to avoid a lot of stress and anxiety. Now we've got things that are urgent, but not important. And these things can stop you from achieving your goals. And they also prevent you from completing what you need to do. Of course, the idea is, or to ask yourself is, can you reschedule or delegate these tasks? An example are interruptions from other people. So it's important then to learn to say no or to encourage others to solve their own problems. Then we've got those things that are not urgent and not important. And these are just distractions. And really, they should be avoided wherever possible. Now, there are some activities that uh, other people can do and they should do, but they're not doing them and they bring them over to you, you know, and let you actually do them. And of course, that's not going to help you. Something that fits in pretty usefully with this as well are the four D's. And that will be do, delete, delegate or defer. If something is not urgent and not important, then you might totally delete that. Or it might be, it's not urgent and it's not important, but it is something that you would like to do. Maybe it's a 
particular YouTube video you want to watch or maybe it's that holiday that you want to book for next year. It's not important, not urgent to do it, but you would like to do it so you can defer it for a later time and then put that in your default diary so that it becomes a slotted scheduled thing that you need to do. The things that are being deleted, they just go into the bin. Defer, we've just spoken about. If it's something that you have to do, then the, ideally you want to have the one touch principle. So as soon as it comes across your desk, if you can deal with it there and then, then just do it. Very often what people do is they shuffle papers. And so something comes across the desk and they say, oh, I'll get to it. And they'll move it to one side. Oh, I'll get to it. I'll move it. To, and they move it from one side to the other side to the other side. And if you've ever started your car on a cold morning, you start it and you let it idle for a little bit before it gets warm enough before you pull off. And if you keep on picking up things that hadn't been completed because you didn't deal with them when they came across the desk in the first place, then it's almost like you're in that idle mode for a first few minutes each time. And if you've got to be in that idle moment for a few minutes for that same task a number of times, well then you've wasted all that time. So it's better to actually do it straight away. Of course, unless it is something that needs to be deferred to later. And then there are those things that you can just delegate. There's also a fine line between delegation and abdication. So sometimes people just delegate out and they totally hand over responsibility. That's okay if it is their responsibility, but if you're the business owner, example, let's say that you've delegated out your accounting or your bookkeeping, and at the end of the year, the taxman calls you up because the accounts haven't been done and they haven't been filed, and you're going to get a fine. We can't blame the accountant. Yes, the accountant should have done what they were supposed to have done, but the buck stops with the business owner. So when we delegate, is it something that I still need to check at the end? Or is it something that I can delegate and I can totally leave it? The flip side to that is, if I do delegate, then I also want to empower the person to whom I've delegated to. So we don't want to delegate something and then keep on rechecking or looking over their shoulder. Because then, of course, what happens is they feel that you don't trust them or they feel disempowered or they might just not do a proper job anyway because they know that you're going to check it later. So there's a very fine line between this doing and delegating and delegating and abdication. So I hope you found that useful. They're just some things that I discuss with my clients when we talk about time management. And I think time management is one of those things that Certainly in a business environment, I find a lot of clients battle with time management. I've also had clients in, in life coaching situations that have battled with time management, especially uh, one lady that jumps to mind who had empty nest syndrome. But I'll tell you about her in a, latest, in a later video. So that's some ideas on time management.